morning, everyone. We're excited that you're here with us this morning for our extension webinar. We've got a super topic in store for you. Uh, I am very excited to have our speakers with us today. I'm Laura Perry Johnson, the Associate Dean for Extension. If you aren't um, one of our employees, we started this webinar series at the beginning of the pandemic and have had a bunch of great topics. If you go to our website, um, extension.uga.edu, under the emergency section, you will see clips of all of our previous videos and you can get a lot of great information, not just on dealing with the pandemic, but on a variety of other topics as well. Uh, the full archive of this webinar today will be archived on our intranet site. So if you have a UGA My ID, even if you don't work in UGA Extension, you can access that. And there will be snippets of the um, three speakers on the front page or our public page of the website. I always pick topics that I want to know something about. And for the last few weeks, we've had several webinars on growing um, fruits and vegetables. And so today we're going to talk about how you preserve those fruits and vegetables. So I'm very excited today and um, we have three fabulous speakers. Elizabeth Andrus is um, no stranger to extension. She is one of our food science special, our family and consumer science specialist um, with an expertise in food safety and preservation. She runs a national center um, on food safety and preservation, and she'll tell us more about that today. Alexis Roberts is our family and consumer science agent in Fulton County, and just a dynamic speaker. I know you will, um, you will be enjoying hearing her today. Kayla Wall is down in Quitman County. She is the family and consumer science agent there and has um, uh, been collecting quite a following with her um, videos on food safety and preservation. So these three ladies have um, some great things in store for us today. And we'll get started with Alexis um, as our first speaker and then move right on into the other speakers. So Alexis. Hi, my name is Alexis Roberts and I am the Family and Consumer Sciences agent in Fulton County and this is an introduction into food preservation. So why do we preserve food? We preserve food for a lot of different reasons. So one of those reasons is to have the taste of the season year round. Um, so you can have peaches that are going to peak in the summer and still enjoy them in the fall and then the winter. And then it's also going to be a really great way to cut down on food waste. So in Fulton County, we have a few community gardens that are sponsored by our extension office and we planted six tomato plants that are all producing right now. So there's going to be way more tomatoes than we could actually consume. So food preservation is a really great way to extend the shelf life of our tomatoes while also cutting down on food waste. Another reason to preserve your own foods is to have a greater health control. So say if you're trying to cut down on the amount of sodium in your diet or the amount of sugar in your foods, if you're canning your own produce, you can control the amount of salt that goes into each jar. Or if you're making your own sweet spreads or jam and jellies, you can also reduce the amount of sugar by using a low sugar recipe. So you can preserve foods for special diets. And then one of my favorite reasons for food preservation, it is the gift that keeps on giving. So they make really great holiday gifts. Um, every year I also give like pickles, jams and jellies, and people really enjoy having that taste of the season year round. So there are a lot of different factors that go into food preservation. So as soon as we harvest any type of food or slaughter any animal, spoilage is going to start to take place. And there are a lot of different factors that influence that spoilage. So we have microorganisms, physical changes, and then also enzymes. So with microorganisms, we know that they're everywhere, right? They're in the soil, they're in the water, they're already on the produce, and they can be harmful. So with molds and yeast, they're most likely going to grow on high acid foods like fruits and tomatoes, and they can also grow in low acid foods, which are going to be our vegetables and our meats. But luckily, these things are destroyed at about 140 degrees Fahrenheit and about 100 to 190 degrees. And then we have bacteria, which can be really harmful and bacteria grows most rapidly. So this is what we're most trying to prevent when we're preserving food. Bacteria can grow in high moist environments, so it likes moisture. It also really prefers low acid foods. And we know that we can heat it to at least about 240 degrees and that will destroy most harmful bacteria that can produce harmful toxins. 
So we also have physical changes that take place, like bruising. So if your produce is bruised, it's actually gonna spoil a lot faster. So a lot of times people think food preservation is a way to save food that's going bad. So one time I had someone bring me a huge bag, like it was a garbage bag size of plums and there was juice and they were dripping and they're like, oh, can you can these? Can you save these plums? Well, you wanna make sure that you have good quality food that goes in that has good quality food that goes out. So for the fact that those plums were already bruising, if I canned them, it would have only gotten worse. So you wanna make sure anytime you're preserving food that you have food that don't have any blemishes or bruising or that will speed up the spoilage process and it can also spoil foods that are around it as well. And then last but not least, we have enzymes. So enzymes are naturally occurring chemicals that are in the foods that we eat. So enzymes are responsible for the flavor of foods, the color, and also the texture. So when we harvest those foods, those enzymes don't slow down, they continue to mature. So we wanna make sure that we're preserving our food in a way that we're either inactivating those enzymes or slowing them down so we have better quality food. So there are about three main methods of food preservation that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about canning, freezing, and drying. There are other food preservation methods as well, such as curing and smoking, and then also fermentation. And then we all preserve our foods when we put them in the refrigerator. So anytime we're doing food preservation, we're just extending the shelf life of our foods. So canning is the process in which foods are placed into jars and heated to a temperature that destroys microorganisms. Canning is one of, one of the only food preservation processes where our microorganisms are actually fully destroyed. Because we talked about that we know molds and yeast are destroyed at a temperature of about 190 degrees and bacteria is destroyed at a temperature of about 240 degrees. So with canning, we can heat up these products so we can destroy the microorganisms. We're also, because we're heating them to a high temperature and activating enzymes as well. So canning is gonna also include pickling and jams and jellies. So freezing, um, which is one of the easiest uh, methods of food preservation, and I've gotten really good at that um, since the pandemic, buying more stuff and then putting it in the freezer. So freezing is gonna reduce the temperature so that microorganisms cannot grow. What's really important to know with freezing is that it does not destroy microorganisms. So many microorganisms are going to survive that freezing process. This is really important to know so that when we dethaw our foods, we're gonna make sure that we cook them to a minimum internal cooking temperature. It's like if you thawed a steak, just because you put it in the freezer and you dethaw it, you're not gonna just eat it raw. You still need to cook it because those microorganisms are still there. It's going to be the same with enzymic activity. So enzymic activity is going to be slowed, but not fully destroyed unless you blanch your foods, which is going to be most recommended for vegetables. So dehydration is actually one of the oldest forms of food preservation. So people have been doing this for thousands of years. And it's actually one of the easiest as well. So when we dehydrate something, we're going to be removing, be removing all of the moisture from foods. So we talked about how bacteria likes moisture. So that's one of the reasons we're going to be removing the moisture so we can extend the shelf life. So drying is also going to slow down the action of enzymes, but not destroying them. So we have a few different ways that we can dry our foods. We can dry them in the sun, which is kind of what has historically been done. And um, you can also dry them in the oven and in a food dehydrator. Um, so in the oven, your optimum temperature is gonna be about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if your oven does not go down to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's not recommended to dry your foods in the oven. If it's, if it's at a temperature higher than that, then you may be cooking your foods. And then also in the oven, you do um, wanna make sure that if you can, for safety, if you, not for safety, but if you can open your oven a little bit and that can create some air circulation, so if you don't have a food dehydrator, which is gonna be most recommended, drying food in the oven is actually gonna take two times as long as in a food dehydrator. So as we can see in this food dehydrator, we have the vents, there's a fan at the bottom. So this is gonna have really good air circulation and also help to prevent humidity or have a low amount of humidity, which is gonna dry our foods a lot higher. So you can definitely dry them in the oven, but it is gonna take a little bit longer. So next we have fermentation. So fermentation is a food preservation method that is just getting more and more popular um, and that people are doing at home. So when we um, ferment foods, what we're essentially doing is that we're converting sugars into acids. 
So um, fruits and vegetables are both carbohydrates. And we know that carbohydrates or carbs break down into sugars, um, so into glucose and sugars. So essentially what we're doing to preserve this food is we're converting those sugars to an acid. And with that acid, we're actually making it a little bit safer to have um, at room temperature. So we know that bacteria likes low acid foods, so we're turning it into a high acid food. And we mostly do this with lactic acid bacteria. So when you're, if you're fermenting your own foods, it's gonna be really important to make sure that you're using an evidence-based recipe because when we ferment foods, we wanna make sure that we have the growth of lactic acid bacteria, which is gonna preserve our foods, but we also wanna make sure that we're preventing the growth of other harmful bacteria. And we can only make sure that we're doing this safely if we're using a tested recipe. So people ferment foods for a variety of reasons. You can do them for preservation, also to enhance the flavor, and there are some potential health benefits of fermented foods. So common fermented foods are gonna be things like sauerkraut. So in this picture, we're taking um, sauerkraut. So we're taking cabbage and that turns into sauerkraut through a fermentation process. Um, you also have kimchi, pickles, yogurt, and then kombucha is also a fermented food. So you may be thinking, which food preservation method is best for you? And the answer is, it totally depends on you and a few different factors. So cost is gonna be a huge um, factor in that. So there are some food preservation methods that are gonna be low cost and you're most likely gonna have the uh, methods or the equipment already on hand. So these are gonna be freezing. We all um, do food preservation in our freezer if we put things in our freezer um, or if we buy things from frozen stores and put them in freezer. So you're gonna most likely have the equipment to do that. And then also dehydrating can be a kind of a lower startup cost as well if you're doing it in your oven versus canning where you may have to buy a canner or a pressure canner and buy additional equipment. It also depends on the type of produce. Every produce isn't meant to be preserved in those three main ways. So for example, citrus fruits is actually not really recommended to go in dehydrator necessarily. So it may be better to actually can them um, or to put them in the freezer. Um, and it also depends on the recipe that you wanna use. So I had someone email me um, last week that asked, hey, I can't find a canning recipe for fish stock. I really wanna can fish stock, how do I do this? Well, the answer to that is there actually is not a safe recipe recommended for fish stock. So that would not be an appropriate food, food preservation method. We would recommend that she stick that in the freezer. So you wanna make sure whatever food preservation method that you're using, there is a safe recipe for that. And that's gonna dictate um, which um, method that you use. So next we're going to go into freezing with Kayla Wall. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kayla Wall, and I'm the fax agent and the 4-H agent in Quitman County. So today I'll be sharing information about dry and tray packing your fruits for freezing, blanching and why that's important for freezing, how to package and label your foods. I'll talk about the headspace when it comes to freezing, and then how long you can store those foods because you can't always store things for several years in the freezer. And then we'll talk about the foods that don't freeze well. So for dry pack foods, that's good for small whole fruits. It gives a good quality to your product without using the sugar. And there are simply packed the fruit, you simply pack the fruit into a container, you seal it and freeze it. For your tray pack, that's where you want to spread a single layer of prepared fruit on a shallow tray. And then you can pack the fruit into a container or freeze. The best part about this, it allows the fruit to be loose and frozen so that you can measure it easier later on. So that if you want to measure out just a cup of you know, frozen peas or frozen blueberries, you're not having to defrost your frozen foods before you do the measurement. You can simply scoop it out and it's frozen and you have your accurate measurement there. So blanching, blanching is so important, like Alexa said, because it slows and stops the action of enzymes. And those enzymes can cause loss of our flavor, color, and texture. Blanching wilts your vegetables and it makes it easier to pack. You'll use this for things like vegetables, like green beans, so that whenever you pack them into your bags or even your jars when you're doing canning, it makes it easier for you to maneuver them in your containers. So we'll talk a little bit about water blanching, seam blanching, and microwave blanching. 
So for water blanching, you use a blancher with a blanching basket and a cover, or a fit a wire into wire basket into a large kettle with a lid. You'll use one gallon of water per pound of vegetables or fruits that you have, and you will put it into your boiling water. Place a lid on the blancher and start counting blanching time as soon as your water returns to a bowl. And then you'll keep that at a high heat for the time given in your recipe uh, for your vegetables that you're freezing. For steam blanching, heating and steam is recommended for a few vegetables like broccoli, pumpkin, sweet potatoes, winter squash, and both steaming and boiling are satisfactory methods. Uh, steam blanching takes about one and a half times longer than water blanching does. And to steam, you'll use a kettle with a tight lid and a basket that holds your food at least three inches above the water in the steam. So microwave blanching is not recommended. Uh, research has shown that enzymes may not be inactivated in the microwave and your flavors could be off and your texture and color will be lost by using a microwave. So to package and label our foods, um, I use my granddaddy as an example in a lot of my uh, classes because he is so old school. Um, he will throw something in the freezer and will not label it. So making sure that you package and label your foods appropriately so that you know what they are whenever you go to the freezer um, before you package and label, you need to cool your foods before freezing. That will allow your foods to freeze better. You want that internal temperature in the very center to be the same as the outside of your foods as well. So it just freezes evenly. There's no loss in taste and flavor. Um, you want to package your foods in measurements and single meals. So for example, if I'm freezing peaches to make a peach cobbler, I want to freeze my peaches in four cup increments so that I can grab that bag out of the freezer and go. I don't have to worry about measuring things out. Uh, I know that bag is for a peach cobbler. You want to follow directions for each food type. Every food type is different because moisture levels are different in your foods. You may have to do some altering before you freeze things. You want to pack your foods lightly because some foods do expand and some foods do constrict once you freeze them. You want to plan for headspace because of the expansion of foods. Make sure your containers are sealed very tightly so that air doesn't get in and your foods don't become freezer burnt. And you want to use those appropriate wraps for meats especially so that those don't get freezer burnt as well. And most importantly, label your packages so that you know what is in that food. Because once things are frozen, there's a lot of foods that look the same, especially meats. You can't always tell which meats are meats. So for headspace to allow between packed food and closure, for liquid packed foods, you want for a pint bag or a pint container, at least a half an inch. For a quart, at least an inch. And that's if your container has a wide top opening. If your container has a narrow top opening, you'll want uh, three fourths of an inch for a pint and one and a half inch for a quart. Um, things for dry packs, same as a half an inch for dry packs across the board. And juices are, if you're, that would be things like stock, um, fruit juices and things like that. You would use a half an inch for your wide top openings, one inch for your quart jars, half an inch for your pint jars, um, one and a half inch for your narrow top pint jars, and one and a half inch for your uh, narrow top quart jars. So containers for freezing. Um, cool whip containers cannot be used. since Those are not always food safe after you have used them later on. They're not good for a long-term storage. Um, Butter containers, the country crock containers that we all use for Tupperware in the refrigerator, can't always, they're not always safe to use. You wanna make sure things are moisture vapor resistant, that they're durable and leak proof, uh, that they won't become brittle and crack in low temperatures. Um, you wanna make sure things are resistant to oil, grease, and water. And you want 
our idea for our containers are to protect our foods from absorption of other flavors and odors that you might have in your freezer or refrigerator too. Um, sometimes something might leak in your freezer um, if you have some fluctuating temperatures and the flavors and odors from one food can transfer to another one. Um, you just have to have those proper packaging materials because you're, you're protecting the flavor of your food. You want it to still taste the same fresh out of the field as it did a few months ago whenever you're pulling it out to eat today. Um, it also, the proper containers help retain the nutritional value of your foods as well. So types of containers, we have rigid containers, which will be your um, more boxier, they're all the same size type containers or you have your flexible bags and wrappings, so that would be your zipper topped freezer bags or your appropriate meat wrapping. So rigid containers can be made of plastic and some glass. We'll talk about the glass in just a minute, but they are suitable for all packs, especially good for liquid packs, because if you've ever tried to pour liquid into a zip, uh, zip top bag, it is near impossible to have a good sturdy bottom. It takes about five hands to keep the bag open. So using rigid containers, squared off rectangular tank containers, that's best for your liquids so that you don't, so that you don't have a mess in the long run. Um, straight sides on containers make your frozen food really easy to get out. Um, you know, if you take it out, take it out of the freezer, and just turn it over on the on your plate that you'll use for defrost, it should just slide right on out if you don't use any kind of oddly shaped containers. That'll make things a little bit harder for you. Um, cardboard cartons that you get with like cottage cheese and ice cream and things like that, they're not necessarily sufficiently moisture vapor resistant for long-term freezer use. So um, again, if you're like my granddaddy, you might have a carton of ice cream that's probably been sitting in there for eight months and it's not any good anymore because it's not meant to last that long in the freezer. So regular gl glass jars will break in the freezer just from the expansion of your foods. If you've ever put glass in the freezer, it's probably exploded from just the pressure of that food expanding but there are some glass jars. You wanna make sure that you use a wide mouth dual purpose jar that's um, been pre-treated for freezing and for canning. So for your flexible bags, you have to make sure that they are freezer bags. You can't use storage bags. You have to make sure that they are designed for freezing because they've got that protective lining within it so that you, preserve the flavors of your foods. So how long can you store your frozen foods? Like I said, that you, you are limited on things. It depends on the type of your food. Um, freezing cannot improve the flavor of your foods. Um, it can preserve most of the quality of your food. And it's best to use, uh, use up your food within a short amount of time. So you'll see over here on my chart that fruits and vegetables, if you keep them at zero degrees Fahrenheit, you can keep those for almost a year. Poultry is six to nine months. Fish is three to six months. Ground meat is three to four months and cured and processed meats are one to two months. So you can't, five years later, you've definitely lost some nutritional value to your foods that's probably freeze or burnt at that point. And just the overall quality is not going to be the same as it would be within those appropriate amount of time frame, that appropriate time frame that you have. So these are foods that do not freeze well. Um, this has a lot to do with the moisture content, uh, like cabbage, celery, cucumbers, lettuce, things like that, those have so much water content in them that they're not going to freeze well. Whenever you defrost them, they're just going to be limp, waterlogged, 
possibly even brown and soggy. Um, they're just not good. Uh, potatoes baked or boiled, um, Irish potatoes baked or boiled, that you might want to use in your soups and salads. Again, they'll just be too soft. They won't have that crunchy potato texture that we like. Uh, cooked macaroni, uh, spaghetti or rice. Once you've cooked it, that's totally uh, changes your game. Um, it's mushy and it tastes a little warmed over. Uh, things like cooked egg whites. You can freeze egg whites, but you can't freeze cooked egg whites. Um, they are a little soft and rubbery and spongy, not a, not a great texture. Uh, things like mayonnaise and salad dressings, it completely separates because you know you've got oils in there, oils and fats, and they're separating. And then fruit jellies that you might want to use on your sandwiches later. Um, if you put those on bread, and then put them in there, it's just gonna soak into the bread. And fried foods, um, they're not, you can't fry a whole chicken and put it in the freezer and think that you can pull it out in a few months. It'll lose that crispiness and it'll be soggy and we don't want that. So the effects of freezing on spices and seasonings, um, Pepper, cloves, garlic, green pepper, vanilla, and some herbs tend to get a little strong and bitter. And those are already some very strong flavors. And the last thing we want is to enhance those flavors. Um, onions and paprika, they change uh, flavor during the freezing. Onion seasoning, onion powder. Um, celery seasonings become stronger and celery already has a really strong flavor and curry develops a musty off flavor. So we can't put that in the freezer, don't want to put that in the freezer. Uh, freezing salt, uh, salt will lose the flavor and has a tendency to become rancid, um, to increase the rancidity of any item that contains fat. Um, so if you're putting a fattier substance in the freezer, you should probably leave out the salt because it will go rancid. And then when you're using your seasonings and spices, the season lightly before you freeze so that you don't run the risk of rancidity or bitterness for your um, spices becoming too strong. So we'll turn it over to Elizabeth now. I'm Elizabeth Andrus, and I'm an Extension Food Safety and Food Preservation Specialist with Georgia Cooperative Extension, as well as a professor in the Department of Foods and Nutrition in the College of Family and Consumer Sciences. I wanted to say a few words about canning as a means of preserving your food today, because it is very, very popular, but perhaps has some more food safety concerns with it than do have some other methods of food preservation. Canning is preserving food through application of heat. And then I'm going to talk in a minute about why I add to my definition plus a vacuum seal. But basically the premise of canning is that food is placed in a jar or can and is heated to a temperature that destroys microorganisms. The microorganisms of concern are those that of course will spoil food as it sits around on a shelf. And eat, but more importantly, the microorganisms we target in canning would make food unsafe to store and consume later, and especially if we tried to store it at room temperature for a long period of time. The heat used in canning will also inactivate enzymes that can lead to spoilage themselves, as Alexis mentioned earlier in her presentation. In canning with jars, air is driven from the jar during heating in the canner and that's important for food quality um, as the food sits in, in storage. But as the jar cools, um, because the air has been forced out of it during processing, uh, things shrink a little bit and a vacuum seal is formed in that jar. And this is important because um, the vacuum seal is needed to keep foods that have been processed safely safe during storage. We don't want to let anything re-enter the jar, so we get this hermetic seal on it, and we don't want things to leave the jar and draw the food out. I do want to mention um, a common misperception is that a vacuum seal on a canning jar means the food is safe, 
and that simply is not true. The vacuum seal is not a sign in and of itself of safety, but it is needed to keep the food safe if it was processed safely in the first place. And if we do canning preservation and maintain that vacuum seal properly, then canning as a method of preservation allows for room temperature storage of our foods. Canning as a method of preservation offers options for many types of foods. There's a variety of fruits for which we have research-based canning processes available. Also a number of vegetables, and that would include some vegetable and or meat and or seafood soups. Um, we have processes for some meats, some seafoods, poultry and game meats, pickles and pickled products, sauces and jams, jellies and sweet spreads. I do want to mention, however, that canning does not offer you unlimited choice in preservation. You can freeze your unique maybe recipe for some casserole or soup, for example, but not necessarily can it if we don't have a safe process that's been researched for that particular recipe. It is especially hazardous to not use research-based canning procedures for low acid foods, such as your vegetables, meats, poultry, and seafood, or for any mixtures of foods that mix acid and low acid um, ingredients that we call acidified foods like pickles, sauces, and relishes. We can't have nearly enough time today to actually tell you and walk you through all the steps in canning. So I wanna mention a few considerations in canning that people who want to do this need to start to read about and pay attention to when they're looking at directions for canning. There are basically two basic processing temperatures with very few exceptions. And our recommended research-based canning processes are based usually either on a boiling water canning temperature or a pressure canning temperature. Uh, boiling water canning is standardized at an environment inside the canner of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, if you're at a higher altitude, we increase the time to get the equivalent of so many minutes at 212 at a low at a, a higher altitude you need more minutes because the temperature will be lower. With pressure canning our processes are standardized to a canner interior temperature of 240 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. That requires that you manage your pressure canner correctly and get pure steam inside there and get air out of the canner before you pressurize it. And again if we um, are at higher altitude we need to uh, change our pressure to, to get a higher temperature because um, the temperature inside your pressure canner is gonna also be based on your boiling temperature of water. The choice in one of these two methods of canning has to do with the acidity of food, uh, mainly due to botulism concerns. And botulism is a potentially fatal or deadly food poisoning that is of concern in home can low acid foods so a lot of our procedures are based on uh, preventing the risk of botulism. Some other things when you get into canning, you'll start noticing are there two basic food preparation and jar filling methods designated as either hot packs or raw packs. So oftentimes your process will even uh, change depending on whether you've used the hot pack or raw pack method. If for some reason a uh, recommended procedure only calls for a hot pack, we only have a hot pack available and there is no way to offer a raw pack for that food if the research wasn't done using a raw pack preparation procedure. I also wanna say, however, that all steps in preparing food to go into your jars do matter to the process sterilizing food is expected. So all of our processes are meant to be used with the preparation and jar filling procedures provided with them. For example, we have probably eight different types of tomato packs. And so there isn't just one canning time for tomatoes. It really depends on how you're preparing them and how they're going into your jar to know which is the appropriate process time. Unlike some other methods of food preservation, canning does require some specialized equipment and jars and utensils that are needed. So there is some initial investment there. And canning as a method of preservation does require applications of, of microbiology, food chemistry, and engineering. So people need to recognize that this is a science and not just a creative culinary activity. A really key concept, one more that I'll spend some, a little bit of time on, is acidity of foods. 
because it is so often um, not understood by people how important this is and how to determine it. But we uh, can can foods that have a pH value of 4.6 or less at the temperature of boiling water or its equivalent at higher altitudes. We also do have some pressure processes for some acid foods, but they are only the equivalent of boiling water. It just uses the concept, if I have a higher temperature in my pressure canner, I can use a lower time. But the targeted microorganisms for these acid foods are the same, whether it's in pressure or boiling water. For canning purposes, foods that have a pH value of pH uh, less than 4.6 are called low acid foods for canning purposes. And all of our procedures for low acid foods do require the use of pressure in processing. Acidity is a major key concept because canning can put one at risk, as I said a minute ago, for potentially fatal botulism poisoning if we don't apply our understanding and use of acidity of foods correctly, um, such as in deciding which is the right processing temperature of either boiling water or pressure canning. And it's also a reason why we emphasize for mixtures of foods um, where we're trying to combine acid ingredients with low acid ingredients that we really emphasize tested recipes to make sure that there's enough acid in them to keep the product, all parts of the product below pH 4.6 if what we offer is a boiling water process. So process times and temperatures besides being affected by acidity of the food, as I uh, indicated right before that, it's also affected by the preparation style of the food um, as it's getting ready to go into the jars. Different aspects of food composition will affect the processing time, um, the viscosity or thickness of a mixture, how tightly you pack the ingredients in a jar matters, the presence or absence of starches, fats, and bones will matter, and then whether the food is um, able to heat by more rapid convection currents throughout liquid in a jar or whether it's a solid pack of food that's a very slow conduction type of heat transfer. The goal in canning is to get every single part of the food in a jar to a minimum temperature for a minimum amount of time while it's uh, processing. Also important in canning safety, however, is how the canner is, if, um, is brought up to temperature or up to pressure and how the jars are cooled because part of the sterilization of food in our canning processes comes from the actual cooling of the jars and anything that's done to change how rapidly that happens can affect whether the food ends up safely processed or not, no matter how many minutes you actually kept it in the canner. So as I've said, the temperature of processing matters. The initial temperature of food as it's filled matters. That relates to the concept where I said the process time um, needs to be appropriate to say a hot pack or a raw pack and how you actually prepare those. The size of your jar or can will influence the needed time and temperature as well as the shape of the jar or can. So that's about as much as we can actually cover in the time allotted today because any one of these could take um, quite a long period of time to walk you through step by step. But um, do realize that there are more food safety concerns with canning than with freezing or drying, particularly when you wanna store foods at room temperature, which is the danger zone for bacterial growth and toxin formation. Um, canning as a method of preservation, therefore, can be a little bit more limited and what can be offered is a method to preserve food. And as I said a minute ago, it's not just a creative or culinary endeavor. You also have to recognize that there's science to creating safe canned foods. It's important for us to teach if we're educators and use if we're doing it ourselves science-based procedures for preserving by canning, just like with freezing, drying, pickling, and fermentation. So um, another conclusion would be we cannot just make up or come up with canning directions for any food or recipe that someone wants to can. That is one of our limitations um, in using canning as a safe method of home food preservation. But to help people with all the necessary steps and details to safely can food, as well as to carry out the other methods that have been talked about today, we do have a number of resources available through Georgia Cooperative Extension. 
One of our highlights is our So Easy to Preserve for Sale book. We are now in the sixth edition and they should be plentiful this summer. Hopefully, even though they're selling rapidly, we did just reprint um, at the beginning of the summer. We also have some demonstration videos in a DVD package for sale. Even though the DVD package is also called So Easy to Preserve, it does not contain the content of the books. It is discussions of food preservation methods in uh, six different shows and demonstrations of how to carry out some very specific procedures and recipes for preserving food. On our extension, UGA Extension YouTube channel, we do have about 17 very short video clips to demonstrate key methods and methodologies. Um, so they can be found under this menu of so easy to preserve um, videos. If you can't find them all organized together, if you go to the UGA Extension video um, channel, if you go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute or two, we do have a link to get you to the view that I'm showing on this slide that'll take you just to the So Easy to Preserve collection. We do have a, a website for people to know how to order the book and DVDs. Um, there's a printable order form off this website, extension publications order form, if people want to pay by check. There's also a link in the second paragraph under the book and also a link in the first paragraph under the DVDs that take people to the UGA Marketplace online store for ordering with a credit card. Our price for the book and videos does include shipping for the 48 contiguous states, people in the US territories, and Hawaii and Alaska are informed that they need to call and get their exact shipping charges before placing their order. We do have a series of free fact sheets that are available on websites or from some of our county extension offices in the Preserving Food series um, that we do make available to people for free. All right, the University of Georgia was fortunate enough about 20 years ago now to actually get funding from USDA to establish a National Center for Extension Home Food Preservation Recommendations. Um, the, we do have a unique URL of homefoodpreservation.net or .org also works. Um, that leads you to a UGA website of nchfp.uga.edu um, that will get you to a lot of information. I do believe we have about 900 web pages on there now. Um, we do have a number of PowerPoint slideshows to walk you through understanding concepts of food preservation, as well as some actual methods like making a chili tomato, uh, chili pepper tomato salsa, for example, specifically, or drying turkey jerky. Um, this was originally funded, as I said, by USDA. It is now managed by the College of Family and Consumer Sciences at the University of Georgia. If we could go to the next slide, um, what you will find here if on the left-hand menu is a link to publications, including the USDA Canning Guide. But further um, on the home page, you will also see a link to the So Easy to Preserve water site, as well as some of our other publications available. And um, if you look under the subheading on the left of how do I, you can get to specific food by food directions for freezing. Like you will actually get to menu to specifically, how do I freeze my green beans? How do I freeze my beef? How do I can peaches? How do I can my green beans? And so forth without having to go through an entire publication. I will mention when you get to those specific procedures, most of them have links within them for things like headspace allotment, how to acidify it safely, how to read about man using a pressure can or using a boiling water can, or, and it's very important that people actually follow those links and read about that also, especially if they're first time food preservers. We do have a curriculum that's available for free right now through the National Center website. People are directed when they click on the link for this to please fill out a little uh, information sheet about their intended use for this. And then they're given a password where they can download the files for this curriculum. It was developed as a National Center project, 
but is intended for hands-on activities with middle school and older youth and walks you step-by-step -step through laboratory exercises and various methods of food preservation, both at a more beginning level and a more advanced level. Um, so that is available to people. We also then came up um, with a preserve it and serve it booklet for sale for uh, use with younger children. If we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is preserve it and serve it a children's guide to canning, freezing, drying, pickling, etc. And this is not really written as a curriculum, but it walks um, an adult through using it with younger children with some basic food preservation methods. And what's a little bit different with this publication, if we can go to the next slide, please, is that in addition to showing people, uh, walking you through how to do something like canning applesauce at the top of the second image here, we then provide three to four recipes with each method on how you can actually use your preserved food um, to do something with that we thought would be more interesting to very young children. So for example, after they've made and canned their applesauce, we have a recipe for some applesauce cinnamuffins, applesauce flapjacks, and um, a applicious peanut butter cookie dough ball there. Under jam, you get a cookie recipe and a jam and yogurt parfait and so forth. And then I also wanted to mention we have some internet presence besides that website. Um, on the College of Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Food page, we do have a complete set of our free fact sheets for the public. They are also available through extension.uga.edu publications also. For in-house University of Georgia Extension agents, we have some agent resources for your teaching that are on an intranet there. And I do a running uh, Twitter feed at the bottom of that page also because the National Center for Home Food Preservation does have a Twitter account and it's at the bottom of this slide if you would want to start following that. Um, I also have a blog in the name of the National Center for Home Food Preservation that's at preservingfoodathome.net or a link off the National Center homepage. And then there's a reminder also that we have the So Easy to Preserve Otter site also available. Finally, one of our last reference uh, resources, I guess we have are our county agents in Georgia and they have been doing some marvelous work this summer um, during the pandemic and shut down to some of our in-person programs. Um, both Alexis and Kayla who have presented today at other parts of this webinar have been active in this area. Kayla has quite a series of YouTube videos demonstrating very specific methods. Alexis has had some very successful live broadcasts. Um, Karen Booth in Hall County has done a series of live broadcasts and videos also. Um, Terry Black and Georgie Ann Cook are partnering in some live broadcasts and Rebecca Thomas I know has been doing some in Northwest Georgia. Um, Jackie Ogden in Chatham County, even before the pandemic, starting in the fall, she's been having our So Easy to Preserve videos run on county government television. So we do have lots of ways for people to tap in to some more specific information and food preservation instruction from UGA Extension. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for that great information. Um, very interesting and very applicable to those of us who want to preserve the bounty from our gardens and from the farm stands this summer. I'll ask you now if you have any questions for our presenters to type them in the question and answer box and I will um, ask them to our experts. Um, someone asked, Elizabeth, I'll just jump right in. Can you still use the old blue book recipes? I assume you know what that means. I do know what that means. Um, the Ball Blue Book, of course, is a historically recognized important resource in home food preservation. But just like our own recommendations and USDA recommendations, um, the Ball Blue Book continually updates its advice. And so I don't recommend using, recommend using old recommendations from anybody. Um, again, I don't endorse everything that's in a ball blue book, even the newest version. Um, I 
your lower risk foods, if we don't know how they've been tested, your lower risk foods tend to be different jams and jellies, um, more condiment or boiling water canned items. But I do not recommend anybody using low acid pressure processing or endorse it other than our own recommendations, which are based on USDA research, because we don't necessarily know the development that has gone into other sources for low acid canning. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, Alexis and Kayla, I'm going to ask y'all to turn your cameras on because I'm uh, about to answer, uh, ask y'all some questions. Um, uh, Alexis, someone wants to know if there is a good resource for canning with low, lower glycemic natural sweeteners like coconut sugar. Um, do you have any information on that? If you don't, we'll pass that one to Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elizabeth might need to follow me up, but I would say um, with preserving, I I guess trying to use alternative sweeteners are generally not recommended. Um, there are pectins where you can use um, like limited amount of sugar or to avoid sugars completely. Um, but I do not know of any alternative sweeteners. Elizabeth, do you? Yeah, you have to be a little bit careful with these, with uh, methods that apply heat, again, particularly canning, because some of these sweeteners are approved or marketed for heated applications and some aren't. Um, sucralose, you know, one of the brand names being Splenda is one that can withstand the heat of canning. There isn't a particular site I would recommend um, because I don't know of anyone that's pulled all this together where I would endorse all of their recommendations. But if you do look at our recommendations, say for canning fruits, there are some suggestions there for uh, either not using sugar at all or using some other lower sugar options like natural fruit juices as your covering liquid also. But there simply hasn't been a lot of testing with all these newer sweeteners that have been thrown into the marketplace in the last five or more years. There just isn't the funding there to keep working on this in home food preservation. So Elizabeth, I'm seeing um, a lot of monk fruit sweeteners. Yeah. Does that include, include yeah. in your advice? Not yeah, I've gotten actually a lot of questions on that just in the last two weeks. So that must be making the rounds. I do not know that I would can yet with monk fruit sugar. I personally explored a lot of the pectin manufacturer websites. They're not yet recommending monk fruit sugar either. So I don't know the amounts. Um, certainly if you wanted to make like a freezer jam mm -hmm. um, or something stored in the refrigerator, there'd be no harm in experimenting with the level of sweetening yourself. But we have to be careful with some of these um, in trying to do a canned jam or jelly or fruit because of not knowing the effect of heat. And if you actually can foods with a, a sweetener like that, a non-sugar sweetener, it's the same quality as canning in water. So you also, if you don't know, you could can in water and then sweeten to taste when you go to eat the food. Okay. But sugar itself has some preservative action on the texture and color of fruits. And you lose that when you just can in water or any non-sugar liquid. Okay. Fruit. Yeah. Well, thank you. The variety of the different sweeteners on the market today are just <laughs> astonishing. Yes. Um, the next question is about the Instant Pot, and I'm going to let Elizabeth answer that too, because that's another thing that is exploding on right. the market. Um, is it recommended for pressure preserving? All right, and if you go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and you can either Google multi-cooker, I mean, I'm sorry, search the site for the term multi-cooker, or find under our publications what I call a series of burning issues. At this point in time, none of the manufacturers of these electric multi-cookers, which would include the Instant Pot brand, has been able to provide us any information that they have done any canning process determination or safety validation with our processes. So my statement on this is that we cannot support the use of our pressure of our processes in these multi-cookers. If someone wants to use them, you have to be willing to trust the manufacturer. But I have been unsuccessful in getting any of them to answer questions about how they actually have tested the safety of canning in them. And that's a red flag to me. 
There is no regulations. Anybody can put anything in the marketplace they want and call it a canner in this country. Um, but because I know how the USDA processes have been developed and the fact I mentioned earlier that the cooling actually matters, as well as the temperature in the appliance and not just the pressure, um, we need to know that that mirrors a traditional stovetop pressure canner to know our process times work. In other words, it's not just important to know you have X minutes at 10 pounds pressure or 15 pounds pressure. We have to know how it heats up. Does it stay minimally at a temperature inside there, not just a pressure? And does it cool down as slowly as a regular canner? And okay. until we can get that information, I can't independently say that they're safe to use for canning. I don't know they're unsafe, but we don't know they're safe. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, the next question Jill asked, I have this exact same question because I have a ton of basil right now. Um, what is the recommended way for, sa for saving it? Um, Kayla, can you answer that? Um, I, I see freezing in ice cube trays a lot, um, but what, what do you suggest? So I would suggest drying um, your basil because I'm in the same boat. I bought two basil plants this year and I put it in my raised garden bed, just two individual plants and it's taken up half of my bed and that's an eight foot bed that I have. It has just multiplied and multiplied. So I've been freezing it. Now, basil is a very tender leaf herb. So it's got a lot of moisture in it. So you have to make sure that you do get that moisture out and dry it appropriately but drying your basil will probably be your best bet to go ahead and get that ground up and put it in an airtight container to preserve it in your cabinets. Along that same lines, if you make pesto out of your basil, how do you keep it from turning brown? <laughs> what, Elizabeth? No, Elizabeth. One. <laughs> I have actually never made pesto and saved it for long-term use. <laughs> I'm, I'm not experienced that. that, night. that. <laughs> So Okay, well, um, I'll keep experimenting and let you know. I tried pouring oil over the top. That does not work. Um, okay, um, will there be a link provided to view this session? Yes, um, we will have each of the speakers, um, their segments broken out in um, closed caption that will be on the front part of our website. Um, we will have the complete archive on the intranet. So if you are not a UGA employee and cannot access the internet, if you will call, uh, if just uh, send us a note. You can send me a note at, um, at um, lpj4h at uga.edu, and I will be glad to let you know how to get that. If there is enough demand, we can have the entire thing closed captioned. Um, it's just that it's costly to do a whole section if, um, if we don't think there's going to be a lot of demand for it. Um, the next question is about quick jellies, like strawberries. Are these safe? They say two weeks. Um, Alexis, what can you tell us about those? A quick jelly? I, I would say we need a little bit more information. So if you're thinking of like freezer, which I imagine is maybe what uh -huh. someone's thinking of, which is like the instant pectin, um, you can keep those in the refrigerator for about 30 days. And then we say in the freezer for up to a year. Um, Elizabeth, do you know anything else about quick? That's what I imagine it is, is a instant. That's what occurred to me is maybe if they were asking, and of course, if you keep it in the freezer, you can keep it much longer than two weeks. We mm -hmm. often point out that lower sugar or freezer jams and jellies, once you thaw them and start using them, the quality may deteriorate a little bit faster and they might separate faster and so it would have a shorter storage life than a high sugar cooked one might, but Again, not knowing exactly what they're making, I'm not sure what else to say. Okay, well, the next question I'm gonna to give to Elizabeth and I already have my bet on what she's gonna say. Is it okay to purchase canning items from an antique store and use them? I would suggest that that's a poor practice and not something to be recommended. Again, it would vary what you might find in something called an antique store, but for example, older canners may not have the safety features that newer canners have. And by newer, I mean even in the last 30 to 40 years. Um, they, you may, may have dial gauges on them that you no longer can get tested for safety or even replaceable parts if you have to replace a dial gauge or a gasket. With jars, um, even if you can't visibly be, see cracks or chips, 
the glass does weaken with use over time, particularly anytime you put like a spoon or a knife or a fork down in there. Any kind of little bit of tapping can weaken the glass on the inside or outside. So I personally would not risk using really old even jars in case I go to all the trouble and money to prepare something and then my jars break in the canner because they had weak spots in them. So to me, that's a poor practice and not to be recommended. Okay. Um, I, Elizabeth, I'll let you answer this one too. Um, the white lids on the jars in the presentation. Um, Allison says she's never seen those before. Um, where do you get them? And, um, and are, is that better than the metal lids? Those white lids were in pictures of jars in a freezer situation or maybe refrigerator, but I think I saw them all in freezer shelves. Okay. Those are storage lids. They're not to be used for canning, okay. but they're something that can screw on the canning jar. They're made to fit either wide mouth or narrow mouth. You can get them from the brand name jar manufacturer, Ball and Kerr, or um, Walmart and some other stores have their own brands also. Okay. Um, next couple of uh, questions are about peaches. Um, I freeze peaches in a freezer container every year. Sometimes there are ice crystals that form inside. Why is that? Who wants to take that one? Okay, Elizabeth, that's you. No one else is <laughs> for a freezing person to answer. I was, um, I was trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you just um, have to make sure that those containers are airtight. Um, it sounds to me like you might not have had a appropriate freezer container and it might not have been sealed all the way maybe even a mismatching of lids if you're like me and you have 10,000 Tupperware containers uh different lids and different bottoms and none of them match you try to make a match sometimes um it's probably just too much airflow and uh not enough not the right type of container and can I add, just make sure whenever you're in and out of your freezer, you minimize the time any doors are open because even a slight bit of thawing out, and if your peaches are even sugared, but fruits that are higher in sugar or foods higher in sugar will thaw a little bit faster. Just a little bit of thawing will allow some water to escape from the fruit pieces themselves or the mixture. And then when they refreeze, they'll be on the surface and not back inside the food. Okay, we have a few more questions. We're coming right up on an hour, but I'll try to get to these next questions quickly. Are peaches considered high acid? I liked Elizabeth's chart. You could, um, if I could remember that, uh, but are, are they considered high acid? They are an acid food, yes. I don't know that they would all be considered high acid, but yes, in terms of canning, they're acid and they're below pH 4.6. However, we now have a caution that that only applies to yellow peaches. There are a number of white flesh varieties that we have discovered have natural pHs above 4.6, which would put them out of the acid canning category. So our newest information on canning peaches says only to be used with yellow peaches. We do not have an acidification procedure for white peaches yet, nor a pressure process for low acid peaches. Okay, man, white some peaches. of these questions are way more complicated than you <laughs> might think. Um, can you freeze tomatoes, Kayla? And for how long can you keep them? So yes, um, obviously if you freeze tomatoes, they're not going to be nice and solid. You're not gonna have your, your good tomato sandwich in December like you would right now during fresh seasons. But you can freeze them raw. Um, you would just dip those in boiling water for about 30 seconds and take the skins off. And then you can pack them into your containers, make sure you leave your head space. Um, like I said, they won't be solid whenever you um, defrost them. They will be, you know, mushy like tomatoes can be. You can um, do tomato juice as well, or you can do your stewed tomatoes. You can also freeze green tomatoes. You can slice those and um, wash them, core them, slice them about a quarter of an inch thick. And um, you can actually put those, fry those after you, you defrost them. Um, for those, no more than, I say, eight months to a year. Wouldn't want to keep it too long. Okay, um, Elizabeth, how much does the, does the preserve it and serve it cost? Do you know? Yes, dollars. Ten dollars, and that includes shipping at the forty-eight contiguous states. Okay, thank you very much. What about freezing homemade sourdough bread, Kayla? I'm gonna give that one to Elizabeth. 
I wouldn't um, freeze bread. Uh, my granddaddy freezes bread, and it oh, just I never freeze has bread all the time. They're probably oh, was that. <laughs> Uh, but it just doesn't ever have, you know, this is also my granddaddy we're talking about. So he'll leave it in there for a long time. But it just doesn't have the right, to me, the right texture. I would so just, like, um, just keep it airtight package and probably a shorter time is better than longer because bread does tend to dry out easily in the freezer. Okay. Um, but, yeah. Um, what about names on pressure canners that you recommend? Is that in, on your website? Elizabeth. No, because in Cooperative Extension, we don't recommend specific brands. I was wondering if you would say that. <laughs> um, uh, Lacey says she's frozen pesto in food saver bags and it doesn't turn brown. Thank you, Lacey. Um, Jenny says, I use a vacuum sealer for long-term storage. Are there any tips or concerns related to the use of a vacuum sealer? That's interesting because we actually talked about that yesterday. Um, yeah. Elizabeth, you want to answer that one? Again, yeah. Um, vacuum sealers are great for long-term storage, particularly of um, frozen foods and some dried foods. They are not any kind of substitution for foods for canning. I, I want to point that out because on the internet, there are people telling others how to can in these plastic pouches, and that's, again, totally risky practice and not to be recommended. But because oxygen, as Kayla pointed out, is one of the culprits in freezing foods, in terms of quality and either drying it out or causing browning, um, vacuum sealing your package will work very well to get the air out of there. And the plastics that come with those machines are generally very good quality for freezer storage. I do, a little caution I gave people yesterday, you have to be very careful with these, most of these vacuum sealers not to suck water or liquid out of the foods back into the machine or it can actually break them and make them unusable again. Even one of the major manufacturers tells you if you're gonna do fruit peaches or blanched vegetables, to do the tray freezing that Kayla talked about first, like lay it out in a single layer and get it at least a little hard before you pull the vacuum so there's no way you can pull moisture back into your machine. Okay, um, the next uh, couple ones I'm gonna to give to Elizabeth and then we're gonna uh, try to wrap this up. But does um, adding or allowing pieces of peppers into jelly recipes when the recipe says to strain them, affect the pH. They're looking at the Serrano pepper jelly recipe. So I assume you're familiar with that. I, I'm familiar with what they're asking and I'm wondering if this is the person that emailed me the same question yesterday, but I know it's not the name. In our pepper jelly recipe where we tell you to strain it, I would not recommend leaving the pieces of pepper in there because it may not gel. It really, it's a cooked jelly. It shouldn't alter the pH once it's been cooked to them take them out but that may not gel because you're gonna be leaving more moisture in that mix and it's important to have the right level of moisture in a jelly mixture. So okay. I wouldn't guarantee that you'd have success if you did that. Okay, the next question is from one of our own agents. Um, we're down to canning with quart size jars. It has been hard to find jars this year, but right. we prefer pint size. Could you partially fill a larger jar and leave more head space without any problems? I would not do that. For one thing, if you leave too much headspace, like half the volume of a quart jar, you are not going to get air exhausted out of there during the processing and you most likely will not get a vacuum seal. Even if you get a vacuum seal, you'll have a lot of retained oxygen there that'll be very bad for your food quality. I, I don't know for sure, but I think it might be safe because you have less mass in the jar than intended and there's plenty of room for it to expand, but it's not recommended in terms of food quality or actually getting a vacuum seal at all. Okay, and we'll take- I know the that. jar situation is a problem right now. Um, it is. Yeah. Um, we, we will take this last question and then we'll wrap it up. How high is the botulism concern for garlic? I was surprised to see that on the bottom part of the chart. I've got some frozen pesto with garlic in it. When I defrost, do I need to eat all the pesto quickly? Okay, garlic is actually at high risk for containing spores of Clostridium botulinum, as is any vegetable that's grown under the earth, because these spores are found very naturally in our soils. So the potential for contamination is higher with onions and garlic and root vegetables than with some others. But he mentioned, I believe, that he was freezing his pesto. 
What's most important, of course, it's safe while it's frozen, as long as it was safe going into the freezer. What's really important then is to keep it under refrigeration and make sure specifically 39 to 40 degrees. I know we always say 40, but the colder the better with regard to botulism. So even when you thaw that out, thaw it in your refrigerator that you know is keeping foods at 40 or below and then keep it stored there and don't let it sit out at room temperature. Okay, well, thank y'all so much. Obviously a lot of interest around this topic and we appreciate you being with us today. I just want to thank Kayla and Alexis and Elizabeth. Uh, you can follow all of them on our extension websites and on social media. They have, they have great things up. I watch it for entertainment. So um, I really appreciate everything that y'all have done um, today. I want to invite you to join us for future webinars. We um, have been holding these on Thursdays at 1030. In August, we're going to transition our webinar series a little bit, and we're going to start featuring um, some of our local county extension employees that are doing great webinars. Um, so we're going to transition this a little bit. Our next one will be on August 6th. And we haven't, we haven't determined what the topic will be, but we will let you know and we'll advertise that on social media. But I do want to remind you to please, um, when you have questions on food preservation or basically anything related to farm families and communities, uh, you can look on our website, extension.uga.edu. Everything related to COVID and the pandemic is, is at backslash emergencies. Um, but you can search for any other topic. You can also go on there and search for your local county extension office and contact them directly. And if uh, none of that works, call 1-800-ASK-UGA-1 and they'll direct you to someone that can help you. We appreciate you all being here today and hope that you will join us for future webinars. Thanks again to our presenters and to our OIT support. We appreciate all of you and hope that y'all have a wonderful day and go home and preserve some of the summer's bounty. Take care. Thank you.